Thanks, Caroline. Um, I just want to remind people that tonight is an informational event, but it's also our first step in establishing alternatives to suicide groups here in Westchester. I know we have friends from uh, nearby counties um, who are also interested in doing that. So that's going to be a broad effort. If you want to be involved in that, or if you would like, we are recording, um, we'd like to get you the link to that. Um, if you've missed any of the presentation, I just want to urge everybody, if I don't have your, if you are a straight peak for the event, I have your contact info. If you signed up um, at the table outside, I also have your contact information. If somehow you did neither of those things, and you want to be in touch, get me your contact information, please, by signing up or catching me. Uh, we're going to be concluding around 8.30, and I'll be here until 9. So, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Adam. So, we're going to kind of continue on our journey here, reflecting on some of these themes of how do we move from institutions to stronger, more accepting communities. How do we shift our focus um, from trying to control to connection? Move from control to connection, and what, what that looks like um, in, in these groups, but also um, the lessons we've learned from these groups. And also, really importantly, moving from just focusing on statistics or DSM codes um, to stories. Um, in that spirit, I'm going to share a little bit about my alternatives to suicide journey. Um, so I come from a faraway land called Indiana. Uh, has anyone heard of it before? Um, Indiana is very different from where I live now uh, in Western Mass. Um, in Western Mass, there's sort of this like revolution that moves through the social fabric there, you know, people question authority, um, it's okay to let your freak flag fly. Um, Indiana is not like that. Um, it's more of a culture where we don't question authority, where you want to really fit in. Um, it's not a place where people are comfortable expressing big emotions. Um, and all of that, I think that, that those external fa factors kind of contribute to my story. Um, and one of the problems with, you know, the environment in which I grew up, where we don't question authority, is that as a kid, there were people in authority roles that hurt me. Um, and because I was a child, I didn't understand that these things that were called punishment um, were actually abusive. Um, and I didn't understand why they started to make me feel mistrustful of the world, really scared of the world. Um, and it was a world where you didn't really talk about things that were unpleasant. Um, but I was starting to have a lot of really tough experiences. Um, you know, I, was, I had started to hear voices that other people um, didn't hear, um, like deep states of sort of despair. Um, and things um, really took a turn for me when I was eight years old. I'm 36 now, so when I was eight, it was the time that the United States entered the first American Gulf War. And I don't know about you, but it was like, here I was, it was this kid, I couldn't figure out how to keep myself safe, other kids from being hurt, and then all of a sudden, you're telling me that bombs are bombed from the sky? Um, and there was something about that that just broke me. It broke me. Um, so I wasn't sleeping, you know, I was seeing these really scary visions, hearing things that were difficult, um, and I came to the attention of a teacher, um, and she asked me what was going on, and I kind of explained it, um, and she said, okay, it's going to be okay, Caroline. We are going to get you some help. We're going to get you some help. And I was like, oh, really relieved. Uh, Finally, I'm going to get some help. We're going to figure out how to stop this war. The adults are going to help me stop it. Um, they're going to help me figure out how to keep kids from getting hurt and make things okay. Um, but that wasn't exactly what help ended up being. Um, so what help meant 
Um, you know, I was taken to a doctor, a psychiatrist doctor, um, and even though I was eight years old, like, I knew, why do people go to the doctor? Because you're sick. Because there's something wrong in you. Um, you don't go to the doctor because there's, like, you know, these, these external things that need to be worked on in the outside world. Um, that needs to be fixed. You go to the doctor because there's something wrong in you. And so that was the first time that I got that message. Um, but that message would kind of follow me for decades um, of my life in the system. Um, so I got the message that there was something wrong with me. Um, and what do you think was offered to me to fix that thing that was wrong? Right, right. Um, and I would love to stand up here and say, you know, that, that, that it worked for me, um, that the pills um, made trauma stop happening in my life, that helped me understand, um, that helped me live, um, you know, with a sense of control in the world, but they didn't. Um, they did not do, you know, what the names, like anti-psychotic, anti-anxiety, they didn't do what they promised. Um, but instead of trying something else, you know, when I was a kid, I would walk out and there would be my bowl of cereal, and then next to it would be a plate of pills. And over the years, like, the number of the pills on the plate and the size of them just continued to grow. Um, and so I gained a lot of weight. I was a lot heavier um, as a teenager than I am, you know, as a grown woman. Um, my hands would shake. I wouldn't have been able to hold this microphone um, with the steady kung fu grip I've got right now. Um, and I was bullied a lot. Um, and I really, really struggled. Um, and so for me, I really, I remember the first time, it was kind of like what Sarah mentioned, where I'm like, hey, I figured out a way to deal with this pain. Um, I figured out a way to make it easier. Um, the way I did that was like, you know, things are really hard. I'm getting sexually harassed at my job at Burger King. Um, I'm being bullied, um, and I'm in a lot of pain, and it's hard to go on. But if I wanted to, if I chose, I could take this whole bottle of Seroquel or Risperdal or whatever it was at the time, probably both, um, and, it, and it would be over. So I'm going on, and it is a choice. Um, that I'm going on. And um, what I learned though is don't, if that's your strategy, don't tell anybody about it. Because um, you may find yourself in places, locked in places that you don't necessarily want to be. Yeah. Um, so struggled a lot in the system. Um, and I remember one time um, that I was sent eventually to a long-term hospital like one where I would stay a number of months. And I think there was a part of me that was like, okay, there's gotta be something here that can help me find that control, um, something here that will help me find that healing that I need to live in this world. Um, but instead, when I got there, it was pretty much the same. Like, they took my belt, they took my shoes, they had me sleep on a plastic mattress, and then every 15 minutes, um, and I'm a sexual assault survivor, so this was really scary, um, every 15 minutes, a large man with a flashlight would come throughout the night to make sure that I had not offed myself. Um, and so, it was not an environment where I could heal, where I could find that that agency, and you know, I'm not one of those statistics of people who who die, um, you know, during or post acute hospitalization. But I thought about it a lot. Um, so, what did change for me? Because you know, I've lived in long term periods in psychiatric group homes, um, long term hospital, as I've said. You know, what what really helped? Why am I still here? Um, for me, a lot of that answer actually comes from community, and community outside of the mental health system, and with different sort of values. 
Um, so when I lived in a halfway house, there was this guy um, that worked there that really saw us as citizens. Uh, he took us to see, like, um, this was in North Carolina. I saw, like, Barack Obama on the campaign trail, that first campaign that he ran. Um, it was also this man who took me to my very first roller derby game. Yeah. Now, if you've ever seen roller derby, the women that play roller derby, and there's other genders that play derby, um, too, um, but the women I was watching were very different from the women I knew in Indiana. Um, a lot of the things that they were doing were the types of things that had gotten me sort of, like, I had been labeled with borderline personality disorder. Um, they were expressing emotion. Um, they had these identities of strength and power. Um, they were assertive, aggressive, um, but they were also working together. And I saw that and I was like, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Um, and I was supported to become a part of this community, one of the first ones I was ever a part of that was distinct from the mental health system. Um, and it was a place where I started to learn new language, new skills. In roller derby, there's no shame in being knocked down. It's all about like how fast can you get back up again um, and rejoin your team. I also developed a new identity. Um, so when you skate roller derby, you don't skate out. It's not like, here she is, bipolar, with psychotic features, borderline personality disorder. No, um, you don't even skate under your own name when you skate roller derby. You're given a new name. Um, so when I would skate out onto the track, people would say, here she is, faster than a spinning dreidel. She'll smear you across the track like cream cheese on a bagel. It's number 18, Mazel Tov Cocktail! And they would yell. Um, and it gave me this new identity of strength. It also tapped me into ancestral identity. Um, and I began to explore spiritual practices and language that before, you know, in this in the psychiatric system, a lot of times there's discomfort around talking about spirituality and culture. Like, I think things have shifted over the years, but, you know, it can still be tough to be able to explore, especially if some of your spiritual experiences include hearing voices, um, as mine have. So, I really was able, through this process of identity and community, to move out of the mental health system um, and find healing, and so I was super excited to help other folks to do that. Um, I wanted to see what the roller derby was for other people, um, what their community was, what was in their heart and their spirit, and you know, I wanted to talk about how this can be a way to shift out of a place where we're constantly wanting to die. Or maybe we're still wanting to die, because I'll be honest, sometimes I still want to die. Um, but roller derby gave me a life worth fighting for. So how do we create lives that are worth fighting for when things get hard as they inevitably do? So I was really excited to become a peer support specialist um, and have these conversations about suicide. Um, but what I quickly found out was I wasn't allowed to go there. Um, so Interestingly enough, talking about alternatives to suicide groups, in my first peer roles in North Carolina, there were two major things I wasn't allowed to do. Number one, don't facilitate a group without a clinician present. Number two, don't talk about suicide. Um, and I remember one day, and this will happen, I'm sure other folks in peer roles can relate, where someone came to that hospital who I had been in a group home. We had been in treatment together, but things felt really different between us. Um, they had shifted. And one day she ended up, you know, trying to end her life um, by drinking poison. Um, and I remember sitting with her in the ER and saying, dude, like, why, why couldn't we talk about this? 
we've talked about so much stuff. Like you skated hockey, I skated derby. Like we talked about everything. Why did why couldn't we talk about this? And in one of the most painful moments of my life, you know, she turned to me and she said, Caroline, things are different now. Things are different. I know if I had told you exactly what you would have had to do, you would have to call the clinical beeper. They would have made me sign a safety contract. And the reason that I wanted to die was because I wanted to leave this hospital. And if I had told you, I just would have been in here longer. Um, and it threw me into one of the darkest periods of my life of trying to figure out what am I doing. Um, and, you know, by the grace of God, you know, someone at the hospital was looking for a job in Western Mass, and he came to me one day and said, Caroline, I found this great organization. I can't work there, but you could. And I am like, what organization? on the planet could I work there, but you couldn't. You have so many more qualifications than me. Um, but it was the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community. Um, and so I gave away half my shit and packed up my car and moved 900 miles to the north. I did not have a full-time job. I had one steady gig, one steady gig, and that was you can facilitate this new alternatives to suicide group that's forming in Northampton. Um, and it has been, you know, one of the most life-changing experiences I've ever had. I've learned so much about just the human spirit and resilience um, and power and meaning over my last seven years of facilitating these groups. At first I was terrified why wouldn't I be? I was doing those two things that I was told um, never to do. Um, but as people have shared of themselves, like I've learned more about myself, and we've created these incredible healing spaces. Um, and in these groups, you know, I've learned. You know, oftentimes, like um, I might be hearing a voice that's telling me that I need to end my life, and it can be really hard. Um, but what I've learned, and having the support of a community of folks that have dealt with similar issues, is that if I'm hearing a voice that's telling me that I should die or having those thoughts, oftentimes there is something in my life that needs to die. Um, not that my literal heart needs to stop beating, but there's a role, a relationship, a conception of myself that needs to shift so that I can go on living. And the best way for me to feel held to figure that out is a community of people where I can speak without fear of judgment, um, of pathology, or force. Um, so thank you for letting me share a piece of, of my journey and why I'm passionate about these groups. Um, we're gonna share now, really ground ourselves in the values of these groups and in the hopes of conveying to you more um, what they're like when they're actually held. So I, I know that some of these are going to be hard to see. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'll just throw one in every now and again to keep us all awake. So, same. We, I, I know these slides are not all the easiest to see. We are going to send a PDF to Adam, so those of you who, who want to be able to see them up close will be able to. But this slide basically conveys the values of the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community, what we call our defining principles. And they say things like respect, optimism, self-determination, mutuality, gen genuine human relationships, and healing environments. And they are not just one of those documents that we created now like 12 years ago that just sit somewhere and no one pays attention to. We used them in all sorts of different ways. They stayed alive, we've edited them as, as we've grown as a community, they've grown with us. And we use them to also shape our groups. And so we're gonna use them now just to talk about what the groups look like. So the first one is healing environments. 
And this slide is a bit of a mix. We're going to talk about what how the healing environments show up in alternative to suicide. We're also going to talk a little bit just about the history of these groups and where they came from. So as far as healing environments go, these groups, they run for about 90 minutes. And, and I said about, but actually one of the things that's important is that they start and stop on time. We, we follow these principles of, of what makes a space trauma-informed. And, trauma -informed. and some of that is not having a terrible microphone that's screaming at you, but also there's no microphones in these groups. But also knowing what to expect in terms of when you start and stop, but also being in non-clinical environments. So this is really important. Why is it important? For a number of reasons. One is just being in a really cold space that has like maybe the lovely green walls of a hospital or something like that, you know, that's not what is going to suggest to people, okay, now share something you've never shared with anybody else. You know, that's just not often what's going to work. Creating environments where it really feels okay to share and where there's no one in the other room who might be operating under a different set of beliefs and principles so that, you know, maybe you can say it here, but if they hear you or they see you enter that group, they know that, you know, they need to keep an eye on you. So we just, we remove it from that area. But we also want you to know, just in terms of where these groups came from and how long they've been around. So they started to get developed in 2008. The RLC actually got officially funded in 2007. They came very soon after. And here's one of the funny things. You know how we said we're not suicide prevention? We get funded through suicide prevention. <laughs> But somehow they accept that. We say, yes, we'll take your money, but we're not going to support this idea of suicide prevention. No. In fact, actually this year, on National Suicide Prevention Month in our newsletter, we sent out something saying, like, we are not going to celebrate suicide prevention. We are going to reclaim this as alternatives to suicide month. It was, I don't know, maybe a bold move on our part. We wanted to make a point. But we still take the money, and in fact, we've gotten a suicide prevention award, too. You know, go figure. But maybe people are recognizing that what we do is effective, and, and that's great. Now, as far as the span of where these groups are existing, they started in Massachusetts. We have a bunch of them in Massachusetts, but they also exist throughout New England. There is one that I'm aware of in New York, in Albany, in Wisconsin, growing in this country, and then also we've now done our first international trainings over the last couple of years. The first one was in Canada. They now have a group, and we have gone to Australia a couple of times and both done these trainings and our two-day conversations on suicide training that is geared more towards providers and family, etc. And there are groups on both coasts of, of Australia at this point. So we are, we are growing and growing fast. Um, so I talked about the power of getting involved um, in that roller derby team um, and helping me move forward and, and fight, fight for life. Um, when I joined that roller derby team, I'm very fortunate there was no psychiatric screening process before I was allowed to show up to fresh meat night. And we laugh, we laugh. And it's, it's silly in a way, but I have before applied for spiritual retreats, meditation retreats um, up in Western Mass, um, where I have been asked whether what my psychiatric diagnosis was. Um, and in order for me to join in this retreat, um, that I had to be screened um, by a clinician because of, you know, uh, my diagnosis. And it was really painful, and it made me not want to join that community. It made me feel unwelcome. Um, it was really hard because, you know, when the Buddha said, I have a path through suffering, he didn't say, but not for those people. Um, but we see that in this culture. Um, alternatives to suicide groups, there is no screening process. Certainly if someone wants to talk to a facilitator, um, before they come to learn more about the group, that's fine. But our groups are really open. Um, and it's available for people to show up when they need it. And I have, I've even heard people say that 
You know, the fact that the group existed was what kept them going. Like, I've heard people share to me, you know, Caroline, I didn't come to this group for three years, but the fact that I knew that I could, that it was meeting every single week in my town, gave me some comfort, knowing I could show up. Um, so we are there, um, and there is, you know, no, no barrier, um, and certainly in our groups, we don't assume um, that people are coming have any type of diagnosis or talk to them in, in clinical jargon or language. It is a community. Um, another thing that's important, um, I get asked a lot, I certainly got asked this from, from O Magazine for that article is, now are you, are you an attempt survivors group? This is an attempt survivors group, is that correct? Um, and the answer is a resounding no. Um, you know, I do not stand at the door um, at meetings that I facilitate, and when new folks come in, I don't ask, well, have you tried it yet? Have you tried it yet? Because uh, if you had, you know, come back. <laughs> and, and when we say this, it seems really obvious. But there are a lot of groups out there that are like, this is only for attempt survivors. You know, you really have to be screened and have this particular experience to be here. Um, but that's not the way alternatives to suicide group um, works. We, we are open to anyone that has a personal connection to these thoughts and experiences around suicide um, that want to share in these values and in this community. Um, and then another question I get asked a lot um, by journalists, especially um, by those that don't understand peer support very well, is they'll ask me, so Caroline, you know, how do you respond to fears that if you have all these people that have wanted or are wanting to kill themselves meeting without a clinician, you know, don't you all just sit around and tell each other how to do it more effectively? Um, do, you, do you just share strategies about how you might die easier? Um, and it's shocking, but that is something that people ask. Um, and what I do is I come back to this value of like focusing on the why. You know, certainly there's times that folks have wanted to share, you know, about like a method, but usually you know, 99% of the time, people want to talk about why they want to die. They want to be validated. They want to be heard. They want a place to explore it without being shut down or locked up. Um, so another thing that I think people misconstrue about these groups is that they're always like very dark spaces. Um, but there is so much laughter. Um, in these groups. And I guess one of the things I suspect is when you're allowed to speak your darkness and not be silenced, when you're allowed to speak that sort of taboo thing or deep hurt that you've been holding, it's a lot easier to move through it if you can just say it out loud and be met and embraced by your community. And when you're able to express it, you know, people also want to talk about other things. Like, where is the best deli in Western Mass. Um, talk about their cats. Um, and what's interesting is sometimes the system um, really narrows in on the topic of suicide and they focus on that as like the most salient part of someone's identity. Um, and that's the conversation that wants to be had. But what I've noticed is there's people that come to group, and on one hand, yeah, they do want to die. They do. It might be the darkest day of their life, and they're really seriously considering ending their life. That's real. But also in that same person, on the other hand, they might be really curious about what happens in the next episode of RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> or on the other hand, they might really care about a relationship that they have with you know, another person or, or an animal. Um, I say that because one of the most common things, one of the most common answers 
people give when you ask, like, so why did you choose to stick around? Why did you stick around when you could have, you know, made the choice to end things? Most often what people say is, I didn't know what would happen to my cat. Um, we even have a button um, at, on the RLC merch table at conferences. We hand out flyers for groups and trainings and such, but we also have um, buttons. Um, and as Sarah has noticed, um, our most popular buttons are ones that have the word fuck on them. Um, people really like that word. I think it helps people folks move through their pain. I've actually even read studies that show like being able to say fuck every once in a while helps to hold a lot more pain. So we have like a, a button that says fuck racism. Um, but we also have a button that says fuck your help, my cat saved my life. <laughs> um, but there's something deeply real about its relationships that keep us here, um, but those relationships don't always have to be with a human. So uh, I do want to mention too in that, in that arena of like the mental health system sometimes it's unending focus on what's wrong I and mean, that's a real thing, right? And sometimes people seem to feel like they're not doing their job unless they are constantly focusing on what's wrong or getting you to go to groups to focus on what's wrong. And as someone who was in a clinical role, as I mentioned earlier, at one point in my life, I, I got to do some interesting experiments. I encourage you to do interesting experiments in whatever environment you're in. One of the things I did is I was in a leadership role over a team that was working in, in, within the clinical framework, and they were all saying something about a person who was getting services who wanted to go on vacation. And they're like, they can't go on vacation. They are not following their treatment plan. They are not doing this. They're not going to groups. We need to get them to work on the problems before they can go on vacation. Okay. So here's what I did. Take it, do it, do with it what you will. I got some letterhead from the organization we all worked for. And I wrote a new policy. And the policy said, you know, to all staff, please be aware we have updated our vacation time policy. <laughs> if you have taken too many sick days, and I forget how many I put, then you will not be able to take vacation for X number of months. And I handed it out at a team meeting. I said, sorry to be the bearer of bad news, here you go. And they all read it, you could see their faces changing as they're reading this new policy. And they were, you know, surprisingly super upset about it. <laughs> and I let them be upset for a little bit. And then I said, so yeah, that's not real, but let's talk about what that felt like when someone said you couldn't do this thing that would feel really good to you because you did something, you know, else. You know, like what, you didn't work enough on being present and not taking sick time so you can't take your vacation time. What'd that feel like? How would that impact you? Because let's now put that back in the frame of the people we're trying to support to have these full lives. So just, you know, a different approach. Like I said, do with it what you will. So mutuality was one of the values that we also talked about. It shows up in our group in really important ways. One of the most important ways it shows up is that the facilitators have that experience themselves and are willing to share about it. That is a requirement of these groups. In hearing voices groups, there's a little bit more of a collaborative approach, so you don't have to have had the experience of hearing voices to go through a facilitator training to become a facilitator, but for suicide, it's really important. Now, why? Why is it really important? Because so many people have experienced consequences for talking about suicide and, and thoughts of killing themselves, and part of what makes these groups work is that the facilitators also do that. Now we have sometimes found, run into like at conferences. There was once a conference we went to where we noticed in the book that someone was doing a presentation on groups that were based on the alternatives to suicide approach. And the first we were hearing of that presentation, even though we you know, started the approach, we were like, oh, let's go to it. We'll see what they have to say. And what the, one of the things they said was, what I just said, facilitators need to have experience, but they can't have thought about suicide for the last year. Huh, like no, no, I can't. they said some other things too, like you can't have a group on Fridays because there's no clinical support available over the weekend, what if they get really upset? Also not consistent with our approach. We 
We have trust, more trust in people's strength. We have a group on Friday. Caroline is one of the facilitators. So why, why is it not important that people haven't thought about suicide? I still think about it. Caroline has already shared that she still thinks about it sometimes. If we are taking suicide out of the realm of only for the quote unquote people diagnosed with mental illness, all that, if we're taking it out of that, we're saying actually this is a human experience that comes up for lots of different reasons, then the idea that you just get fixed and somehow it never comes up again, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And it really gets in the way of the facilitators being able to share what's real for them. So that's really important and it makes a huge difference because sometimes people show up to these groups and they don't want to say anything. And that's okay, by the way. These groups, it's not one of the groups where we go around and everyone gets to share. We try to create more of a natural space of who wants to speak and there can be a conversation and things like that. But people can also come and not speak. We've had people come to some of these groups and not speak for months until they decide that they can actually trust the group. And that's okay. And one of the ways they come to trust it is because the, if the facilitators can take that risk and talk about what they're talking about, then maybe they can too. And so that's really, really important. Now, as it says up here as well, all people are encouraged to share authentically and support each other. Now, it's not just about the facilitators. You know, so it's not one of those groups where, you know, you speak and then the facilitator responds, and then you speak and then the facilitator responds. And, that's not the point. The point is we all have wisdom to bring. We all have things to learn from one another. I actually am not a huge fan anymore of the word mutuality. Caroline and I were laughing about that earlier because I got the mutuality slide. But I love the concept. The reason I don't like the word so much anymore is because it's become a buzzword that people don't understand very well. But what it actually means at its very core is that the focus is on the relationship not on one or other person being the fixer or the broken one. And the assumption is that everybody involved can learn and be impacted by the connection. And that's really important in these groups. And so sometimes what that means is that if someone's having a really hard time and they don't want to go home at the end of the group, it's not necessarily the facilitator who might stay. Sometimes it's other people in the group. Connections get made, people form a community, and they can support one another. And it's much more healing and it actually just has much more potential. So there have been times when the facilitators have been like, well, either it's snowing a lot or there's a holiday or something's come up. But they said, we're going to cancel group. And sometimes it's happened. And then people who are in the group have been around for a while say like, well, you can cancel it. We're still going to have it. You know, maybe we'll meet in a different place, but we're still going to have this group. That is when you know that this approach is working. That's what the group is, that's how it's meant to be because of this idea of mutuality. So that also gets at that last point. It's collectively held. The idea is creating a mini community. And does that always go super smoothly? Any guess? No. No, absolutely not. Human relationships are messy. And yet, in the relationships where there are all kinds of rules to try and prevent that mess, you also take the power out of them. And so here we accept that there's mess, and we hope that when there's disconnections, that especially to people who have had lots of traumatic things happen in their lives, and who have often had conflict and then seen it resolved in not healthy ways, that this is an opportunity to be a different kind of community where we can work through conflicts in maybe hopefully some healthier ways and come out stronger on the other side of it together. So the defining principle of optimism, how does that relate to a group where we are coming to talk about some of the very deep struggles that we deal with, you know, as a society, as individuals that have been going on, you know, for hundreds of years and we haven't found a solution. Um, I, I want to tell, just to sort of illustrate like a story. Um, I remember this was a Monday night. Uh, a woman came to the group that had been coming to the group for, for weeks. Um, and this woman was really, really struggling with the desire to hang herself. And she was sharing in the group, she said, I've tried this drug and it didn't work. 
I tried this drug and it didn't work. Um, you know, maybe I should try ECT. Maybe I should try TMS. Um, and I remember that night, um, my facilitator, my co-facilitator for the group, these groups are co-facilitated, Sean Donovan, coming from a place of curiosity and saying, well, first validating this woman's pain and saying, hey, that sounds so frustrating to be in so much pain and have tried all these things and they're not working. I'm just curious for you, how would you know that they were working? What I mean is, how do you want to feel? And I never forgot what that woman said, um, because she didn't say, I want to feel happy all the time. She didn't even say, I don't want to feel sad ever again. What she said was, I want to be able to walk, feel like I can walk into a room and that I belong there. So essentially, it wasn't about, I don't want to feel pain ever again, but what I want is to be in pain and be accepted still by community. Um, it's not about making you know, my difficult experiences go away. And I think there's so much truth in that, and it's stuff like that that really gives me my optimism um, and my faith in these groups. I know that a lot of the times, you know, I can't fix a situation. I can't make someone's pain go away. Um, but I can provide a space where they can be welcomed and express it um, without being judged. Um, and to me, there's something really powerful about that that gives me hope that as humans, we've been through, we can go through some really tough stuff. We go through pain. Um, but the biggest thing that we don't want is to have to go through it alone. So how do we do that? Um, having faith in that what we can hold as human beings when we don't have to hold it alone for me, is a lot about the optimism um, of these groups. And also, you saw in that interaction that I kind of shared, like, that we had in the group, sort of this curiosity-based approach over fear. Um, you know, if that woman had been in the system, the response might have been, you know what, um, if all those things haven't been working, and you're still feeling like you want to hang yourself, then we should probably look at inpatient for you. Um, but instead, instead of like saying what needed to be done and coming from this place of like, I need to control this moment, you know, in the alternatives to suicide approach, we ask a question. We want to know more. How do you want to feel? Um, what would you want life to look like? If you could take one thing away, what would it be? Is there anything in your life as dark it is, as it is right now that still gives it meaning? Um, you know, optimism can come in the place of like, we just don't know. Um, so we're learning and we're exploring together. Um, and optimism is feeling like, you know, as long as a person still has breath, you know, it's not a lost cause. Um, sometimes folks during facilitator training, they're really nervous. They're like, oh my God, like, I don't call the police on people. Like, this is so different from my job where I'm told that I need to call crisis whenever someone says, um, you know, this word of suicide. Um, like, I'm really concerned, like, what, what do I do with this? Um, but a lot of it is about, you know, putting our faith um, in the community um, to hold. Um, and as Sarah said, you know, we have, using this approach over the years, there's very few people that we have lost. Um, so what I tell those facilitators is to remember 
you know, those, those learning facilitators. People came to your group for a reason. Um, it's not always easy to make it to a group. Um, people who come to a group, even if they don't speak, are people that are looking for another way out. Um, people that express thoughts of suicide are people that are saying, my life as it is now isn't working. Um, so rather than treating these people with a sense of fear, maybe we could have like a sense of honor and say, hey, despite everything they're going through, they showed up in this community and have optimism around that, even if the things that they're expressing, they're expressing a lot of pain. So genuine human relationships was another one of those values and how that shows up in the groups. We've already mentioned some of these things, but it's not all about suicide, right? So many different topics. And actually, if you happen to reside for some reason next to where alternatives to suicide groups are being held, you will hear a lot of laughter. You just will. There's a lot of laughter in these groups. There's tears. There's anger. By the way, anger is accepted. When we do role plays in these trainings, we specifically ask for uh, people to think about and to play out how would they approach anger in the groups because what happens to anger in the system most commonly is people get told things like, calm down, because that's really effective to tell somebody who's angry to calm down, right? Yeah, no, people get to be angry and say, why? So all, all the range of emotions. And also, you don't have to be having a hard time to come to the group. There is power in an environment where you're not just always seeing people in their worst moments. People who have been coming might come and say like, yeah, I was struggling, I also want to share this success now, this great thing that's happened, or where I've moved through in my life. And they're allowed to have all these ups and downs and still be a part of the community. It's not a community that says, there's only these set of times when you can come here. And I already mentioned this idea of people holding more responsibility, not just the facilitators, but it's also not one of those groups where we say, we are not encouraging connections beyond this group. Don't make friends beyond this group. There's danger in sharing your phone numbers, things like that. There are a number of groups out in the world where they draw those limits. Here, we have a listserv for some of the groups. And someone might send out to listserv, hey, I'm going bowling after the group tonight. Does anyone want to come? Things like that that happen. Those relationships develop. It's part of what makes this work. So we talked about some of the myths at the beginning of the presentation. Um, some of these old ideas that you know conventional suicide prevention approaches are based on. There's another couple of myths that um, we didn't touch on, but that people have brought up to us um, before in the past. Um, one is the myth, uh, we had someone, I think it was like Canada or Australia, she was like, there's a myth you forgot. Um, there's this myth out there that we're supposed to be happy all the time. Um, and if we're not happy all the time, that there's something wrong with us. And I realized like she was totally right. Like there's always this message out there that we're supposed to be as humans um, in this sort of like state of like bland contentment, always. Um, and if we're not, um, there's something we're supposed to buy, or we're supposed to ask about a billify or something. Um, there's always, <laughs> you know, this sense that if you're having these tougher times, these tougher emotional states, that there's something wrong with you. And when we talk about dignity and respect, um, which are critical parts of these groups, it is about giving dignity and respect to these other emotional states that are our human inheritance. Um, you know, the sages in my tradition say, to everything there is a season, a time to laugh, a time to cry. Um, we honor that in these groups. We treat these emotional states, these times of pain and suffering with dignity and respect. And 
You know, another myth is also the myth of the perfect word, the perfect phrase. I get this a lot of doing trainings. Like, people say to me, Caroline, tell me the thing that I'm supposed to say that'll fix things. As if, you know, the struggles that people have with these systems of oppression and, like, lifelong abuse that they're healing from, as if there was some phrase that I could say that could, like, make it all magically go away. Um, it's a myth, but it's a huge one. A lot of us have bought into it. Um, so a big shift that we're trying to make in these groups is how do we honor where a person is? Um, often we talk about, instead of taking responsibility for a person, what is our responsibility to? Um, so we're not responsible for controlling a person's life. We're not responsible for you know, the choices that we make. And we, we really cannot take someone's pain away. But we can be responsible to hold a space where we deeply listen. Where we deeply listen. We can have a responsibility to be vulnerable about our own emotional states. Um, because there has never been, there is such a powerful shift that can often occur. You know, when you've shared your deepest, darkest fear that you've held alone in your bedroom for 20 years, and somebody looks you in the eye and says, me too, um, there's something profound that happens in that space. Um, so alternatives to suicide groups they are not about fixing or taking control, but they really are about partnering, community building in times of struggle. Um, so if a person comes and is really struggling, instead of you know, making assumptions saying, you came to this group today, can you tell me like, what, what you think you might need? Um, and having that conversation. Um, and also, being transparent about, you know, our own fears, our own emotions. Like, if it feels real for me to say, I feel scared, I don't know what to say, it would be really hard for me to never see you again that I know. Um, that reality, we can express that. Um, and I've seen so much, such stronger connection create when someone says something that honest and transparent than when someone's like, you're symptomatic, you need to go to this um, institution for your own good. We don't know what's best for other people. Um, our role is to, to deeply listen, to be curious, and what we can know is our own emotional state and we can be vulnerable about it. And it's amazing how liberating that can be. It's amazing how when we're willing to share how we feel or what we've been through, how that can open wide open a door for other folks to walk through and do the same. So for those of you who are out there wondering how many slides do they have, <laughs> this is our last slide except for our contact information. So once we're through this slide, we'll go to questions. Okay. Now, this slide represents something that we have come to call VCVC. It was developed by Caroline, and it was developed in response to all those people who said, what is the formula? We've come to your training. We've sat through the facilitation training. We still don't know exactly what to do in every situation you did not tell us. <laughs> there is no magic formula. There really isn't. There's, there's all the things we've already talked about, the being present, the being curious, all that. But this was the best effort to offer something, a formula of sorts, this VCVC. So it's really captured in what we've already said, and I'm just going to go through it quickly. So the first V is validation. And that's the place where we let someone else know that we see them, that we hear them. And then the C is curiosity. And that's where we let people know that what we see, what we hear, we're willing to explore together. And both learn from it. 
It is really powerful. People are the experts on themselves, but sometimes what they know about themselves has been so layered over by so much else that someone else being curious and just listening also helps them learn more about themselves as you learn with them. The second V is vulnerability. That is where you let yourself be seen, where you share some of yourself, your limitations, your fears, your experiences, so that the other person is not the only one being seen in that connection. And the last C is that community we keep talking about. And how we boil that down most succinctly is to say that these groups, this work, and this actually we use this not just for the groups, but when we do the general alternatives to suicide approach trainings as well, that community, it's about being a bridge and not a life raft. Sometimes people are encouraged to be, or try to be, because you can't be, try to be the savior of someone else. And sometimes in order to be helpful at all, you need to let go of that idea that you can save anyone else. That you can be a bridge. You can be a bridge to so much else and to that community that might be life-changing for somebody. And I am going to end just with another little piece of my story that I think represents some of this, especially that curiosity. So I am one of the trainers for Alternatives to Suicide and Hearing Voices and a lot of the trainings that we do as is Caroline, but I've also been through trainings or, or sat through them as a trainer and uh, participated actively myself. And in one training, some years ago, I had something happen to me that was a big deal. And that is related to this part of my life. So I shared with you up to the point of the recovery learning community and vision, right, and how that impacted me. It wasn't, you know, like an immediate fix or anything like that, but as I moved forward over the years, I kept learning more and more about myself. And at some point, I kind of thought, I'd figure things out, not that I wasn't going to have hard times, but that I kind of knew what those hard times would look like and how to get through them. And then, and then, in 2010, I decided I wanted to have another baby. And this baby was gonna be super planned, unlike the first baby, right? And I like numbers and I like patterns. So I'm born on January 9th. My son is born on January 1st. I like that. Then his dad is born on October 7th. So I'm like, the closest I could come to making a pattern is to aim for October 1st. I preferred if I could also move the dad's birthday to October 9th, that would be a better pattern. But I can't do that. So at least I can try for October 1st. So I planned, I aimed, and I got pregnant. And I was due in October. I don't know, I didn't know if it was gonna be October 1st, but I knew October. And then I had a miscarriage. And I'm like, all right, never mind the plan. I just wanna have another baby. So let's try again. We tried, I got pregnant right away. And then I had another miscarriage. And then I got to this point where I'm like, all right, it's back to where I could aim for October 1st again. Let's plan, let's aim. Got pregnant. October was going to be the due date. And this pregnancy helped. I didn't so much. I kept thinking, I would feel the baby kick, and then I would think the baby disappeared. I would go through this cycle all through my day. I would try and hold on at work, but sometimes I would just kind of lose it, and I would leave work abruptly, and I would run home to use this baby heart monitor that I would rented off some random place on the internet just to prove that the baby was still there. And I was having nightmares, and I was going through so much pain. I got myself kicked out of an OBGYN office because I am a bad patient on a good day. Good day this was not. And I would call them, and I would say, you need to give me an ultrasound right now. You need to give me an ultrasound right now. I need to know the baby's still there. And they're like, nope, goodbye. So I got my new OBGYN. And I went and I said, oh God, I know that I have learned not to talk to people in these professional roles, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to try with this new OBGYN to explain to her what has been going on for me. So I told her about the miscarriages. I told her about what I was struggling with. I asked her for an ultrasound and I thought for sure she would say, you know, you went through a really traumatic year and your reaction, what you're going through, it makes sense. Instead, she asked me what kind of psychiatric drugs I was taking, for what I was going through. So I'm like, red, flashing, neon sign, reminder, don't talk to people about this. 
So I went back to not talking and I got through those nightmares and I got through everything I was struggling with and I'm like, all right, I just need to hold on because once my baby is born, it will be okay. My daughter was born on October 11th, 2011. Still kind of an interesting pattern there. And it's still a one, it's just there's two of them. And she was healthy. And I thought everything would be okay. But it was not. I started having visions that were telling me to hurt my baby. And in fact, those visions would come strongest when I was on the third floor of the building I work in most frequently, and those visions were coming and they were telling me to drop her over the railing of the third floor that you could see all the way down to the ground floor. And I knew then, even though I was in this supportive community, oh, mothers who hear voices and see visions and uh, have thoughts of hurting their children are not received well in this society. I am not going to tell anybody about this. So I just held on more tightly, and I figured I would get through it, but it kept happening. Now, we come back to this training I mentioned I was in. And I was sitting in this support group, because we do these actual support groups in the middle of these trainings, and I was sitting in this support group, and I was not speaking, I was one of the people who was just listening. But I was listening to other people share things that were not the same as me, but were relatable in ways. And I was listening to the meaning they were making of them, and what they were doing with them, and how they were moving through them, and it happened very fast for me. The meaning for me came to me, and what I figured out was that these visions were not telling me to hurt or kill my baby. They were telling me I still blamed my body for the death of the two babies that I lost. It's a really interesting place to be in as someone who's thought of killing myself for so many years to then have lost these babies inside me and blame myself. It was like all this life and death stuff was really, it's a lot to hold. And that's, that's what it meant. And it was strongest on that third floor because that's where I felt the first miscarriage start. And once I realized that, the visions did not immediately go away, but they lost a lot of their power over me. They stopped being so scary because I understood what they meant. And it's not that I couldn't ever possibly have come up with that on my own, but there's something special about being in these spaces where that space is held for people to just slow down and think about what does this mean? And I don't know when it would have happened for me had it not been in that group. That group really changed things for me, and those visions did eventually stop for me. And my daughter turned seven in October. Usually when I tell this story in trainings, I've got some very lively pictures of her up here. You can see her, she's tall, and she's powerful, and she's got a lot to say. <laughs> so in case, I just wanted to share that with you, because it speaks to me anyways to the power of some of this VCDC stuff we're talking about. I think with that, we're going to open it up to questions. If you don't have questions, we think you don't like us, just, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say something. Okay. I just, oh, now my mic is on. Um, Sarah and Caroline, thank you both so very much. I have to say, we do a ton of events, and I don't think I've been in a room with this many people. We had about, I think, over 85 people before the break here, and I've never been in a room that's so quiet in my life. Um, so what you say and the way that you say it is so mesmerizing, and I think everyone would agree that it, it was like spellbounding. I don't think we could, we couldn't get up, we couldn't open our chips. It was like we just wanted to know what was going on. Um, so thank you so much for being here. We're so happy that you're here. And now we'll go over to Kristen. If, if I can state quickly, we are recording, um, but the camera's gonna stay on our presenters for your privacy. If, um, so we'll capture your voice if you prefer that that not occur. Um, raise your hand, I'll get you a card, and you can record your question. And, and I want to be frank, too, because of the lights, it's a little hard to see, so I know that there's been some questions over here, but help us to not miss people who might be in the light blur. Um, following up on, on Adam's statement of 
about even in Canada when you're protecting people's privacy. How do you protect the privacy of people who come to your booths? Yeah, that is a really good question. Very important. Um, there is not tracking. Okay, so I will say there is some tracking in these groups, but never would it be a name. So, so we, for our funder, um, the information that we give them are strictly numbers. They do also ask some demographic information about who attends in terms of gender um, and age. Um, but yeah, an alternative to suicide group, and we cover charter when we um, these groups have a charter. We didn't go into that level of depth. Um, but an alternative to suicide group um, should always you know have strict privacy, never be taking any type of attendance of people's names. And when we open the groups, I'll also offer, um, we do go around and we, we ask people you know, to share the name and pronouns um, that they would like to use in the group. Um, and we're always careful to say, if you don't want to use the same name or the same pronouns that you use um, in other spaces, with your family or at work, that's fine. We just, we don't want to make any assumptions, so let us know in this group how you want to be referred. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming out and doing such a great presentation. And I believe in, you know, in the method. It's, it's person-centered. It's not looking at a diagnosis. It's just talking to the person and being honest and realistic with them as to why and asking, not being scared to ask the questions. Now, in terms of these trainings, how soon are you looking to move forward to help and train us? Because this is something that we do need. You want to answer? I'll take this one. Um, <laughs> exact dates to be determined, but we're looking at late March, early April. Uh, so if I have your contact information, you'll know about it. Okay. Hi, how are you? Thank you again so much for the presentation. It really is phenomenal. Um, and very, very, this is, I do emergency crisis. I was speaking to Caroline before. And so many things that you were saying is just be with the person. That's it. Just be with the person. And it'll go from there. You know? Um, and it's, you know, you're giving, you're giving the person more of an identity than just diagnosing them. Because how often do people identify with their diagnoses? So they should. It's just, you know? But in any event, um, the age group, it's adult only, I assume, or are there kids, or teenagers, or? So we absolutely would like to have groups for people who are under 18. I will say we don't check people's IDs when they come through. So if someone comes in and they're kind of you know, on, the, on the cusp, we won't know about it. We're not looking to catch people. But certainly if, say, someone who's 10, and 10 is the age my son was when he first said, I wish I were dead. <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, and, and honestly, my first response was to train him not to say that at school. And then also in my head, as a mother who is in panic, you say, what would Caroline say? What would Caroline say? Because I lost all sense of being able to say anything sensible. Uh, yeah. But uh, we've noticed that 10-year-olds, we have to say something. We want these groups for young people. They need them. They would benefit from them. The things that are offered in schools, at least in my experience, are generally not helpful and usually just sort of a way of tunneling people into the system to get diagnosed. And yet there are different legalities involved with young people. And so anybody who has the money, resources, it doesn't have to be us, who has the time to figure out how to make that happen in a real way, we would be happy to support. And in fact, in Australia, they did create the first group for young people. That group is particularly for young trans and gender non-conforming people, an alternative to suicide group, and we're continuing to support them. We got an email from them in the last couple of days, actually. Uh, so we want to support people, we want to do it ourselves, but it's a little more complicated.
Like he said, ah, I knew the girl from the group home. I know the community from the group home. And we're all in the group, and then I gotta go to work. How do I differentiate going back to work and that person there and not still? Like, knowing that, how do I put it? Um, they feel like I feel sometimes, and not being able to, um, the job wants you clinically to say, do I need to call 911? Do you need to go to the hospital? And I personally know that maybe you just need to talk to me, and we just need to talk. Maybe, how do I differentiate or uh, cross, not cross a boundary? I don't know quite how to put the question, but how do I go to work with the, knowing the same community and still do my job without crossing the job line of hell and my personal belief of how do you feel? So the question is, um, for example, say you work in a clinical setting, but you also attend alternatives to suicide group, um, and someone that you know from the clinical setting is also in that group. Like, how might you navigate that? It's how, I can't see your face at all. Did, did I get it? Um, is that the question? It's somewhat. It's like, I know more than one in the community, and I'm sure that um, my belief system is not like my job setting. I believe that. I believe your belief, because I have all those issues. And I don't want to be told, take a pill or go to the hospital. But in my job, when I'm working with others, and they say these things by standards, I'm this new mandated reporter, and if I don't, and something happens, and they're mine on my case, or let's just say that, and it happens, and I didn't know it, that I heard it, how do, I don't know. So is the question I, more, so it sounds like the question is more, how do I bring this as an approach to a clinical setting? How do I bring some of these same values in the setting outside of the group? Is that what you're asking? Okay. <laughs> no, I think, I, because, yeah, I, I feel like those are two like slightly different things. I mean, you heard, we have people that work in clinical settings that come to alternatives to suicide groups. Um, they are clinicians. They have nowhere to go. They have this extra layer of not being able to be vulnerable about what they experience, and, and they, they come to these groups. The groups are very distinct from the clinical world. So the way we view it, our charter says, these are, these are not clinical groups, these are social groups. So in a lot of ways, these are groups where people, like any other group in the community, where people with a shared experience come to talk about it, but it's not treatment. It isn't treatment. What happens when I go back to treatment? And I'm still, mm -hmm. you know, with this person, I'm going to take time. So somebody, you know, so you've been in a group with someone that you're supporting in a clinical setting? Right. Yeah. So our groups are distinct. They would be different from your role, like in another job, you hold different values. So the expectation is a facilitator does not share um, you know, what's discussed in that group with anyone else, whether that's their supervisor or... I know that. I'm saying... Are you saying legally how will that impact Yeah. Yeah. I think it's more the, the role right, and the role issue of that you know, if your personal belief is more about what you're doing in the groups, maybe either as a facilitator or a participant, then you have to go to work and that same person says in that setting, I'm, I'm thinking about suicide. And the clinic or whoever it is that you're working for says the mandate is you have to tell <coughs> that sort of that personal conflict. So I think there's, there's layers here. I'm gonna try and respond to the layers and hopefully I'm gonna hit the mark in what you're looking for. So first of all, I just wanna be honest, like, you know, we're not experts on New York law and anything that you bring to us and, and before we do a training here, we'll, we'll learn more about 
uh, like a full facilitator training. Uh, we'll learn more about New York law, but here's what we understand in general. One is about mandated reporter, and this is just important for you to hear. Often people are told they're mandated reporters and they're given the impression that this is a mandate from like some place above the organization, government, law, et cetera, and that you are mandated reporters and now anytime someone says the word suicide, you must report it. Actually, what mandated reporter law means in, in every place I've been to so far, in this country, actually in Australia as well, is that you are mandated to report abuse or suspected abuse of someone who's an elder, who's over a certain age, who's a child, or who's labeled as disabled by a caregiver. It's got nothing to do with suicide. And so when we use that language, I just would offer some caution because it's disempowering to ourselves. Because what's easier to change? A mandate from some mysterious place outside the organization or an organization's policy? The organization's policy is gonna be easier to change because it's happening right there where you work. Usually when Organizations tell you you're a mandated reporter, you have to report suicide. What they actually mean is they have a policy in the organization that this is what you do. And so that gives you some change agent power if you understand that. And some organizations have successfully changed and shifted. And some organizations don't even have a policy when they say it. We got a request from an organization that said, help us revamp our policy. We have this policy that says you must report when someone says they're suicidal, and we said, okay, show us the policy. We'll help you edit it. They said, we're looking for it. We said, okay. Did you find it yet? Nope, actually, we found out we don't have one. We just, we just all thought that's what we're supposed to do. And so, and from there, that's just there's more power there to change that. So, there's that. Then, I would say, if you are someone who, when you're on your non-work hours, is in a group and then you go back to your work and you see people and you feel like, oh, do I have to report what I'm seeing in my non-work hours in this alternative to suicide group? I would say, look to 12-step groups, for example. There's a really clear expectation that if you're in a 12-step group for your own reasons and then you go back to work and you found out something in the 12-step group that the people at work might want to know, they don't get to know. And that's the same expectation with alternatives to suicide groups. Now to that last layer of what do you do when they actually are saying that and you're in your clinical role, that's tough. And one of the things that I would say under that vulnerability piece, when we talk about BCBC, one of the things we talk a lot about is transparency. You are not going to have the power to change something in that moment. You might, over time, as a change agent, be able to change the policy Library will close in 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Sorry, that really threw me. I'm going to be honest. But when we talk about VCVC, that, that truly, that vulnerability piece includes that transparency, and that means making sure someone knows ahead of time, before they say something like, hey, I'm suicidal, that they know what the expectations are for you to do, and that then your responsibility come, becomes to give them the resources where that's not the case. Whether it's a peer support line, an alternatives to suicide group, wherever they might be able to go to be upfront and clear about whatever they want to say. And I'm hoping that in all those layers that that addressed what you were bringing up. I know there's been like some confusion about it, but I'm hoping that that's helpful information to people in the room. Um, hi, Caroline and Sarah, first of all, thank you. Uh, it was amazing. Um, and is it okay if I just say about your HBM group really fast? Because I want to jump on that opportunity. So anyone who really found this um, as something you're very interested in and, and wants to learn more, there's also um, what's called Hearing Voices Groups, which got mentioned several times during the presentation. Uh, Caroline actually helped train a number of us in HBN groups a couple of years ago. And I just, I, I put some flyers in the back uh, and, and information about HGN groups. I didn't bring nearly enough of them. So if you are interested, um, come talk to me afterwards because it's, I think, something that would probably be of interest to most people to find uh, alternatives to suicide interesting as well. Thank you.
Thanks, Jeremy. And I, I just want to amend too. One of the things I meant to say in terms, also in addition to transparency to that previous question, is there's still all these pieces of VCVC as validating and being curious and all those things that you can still use while being clear that there are things that will be expected of you. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Pedro. Um, I'm actually a peer specialist in Zone 6. Uh, I'm supposed to be working for an organization out of Albany that works for people with uh, diagnosis like myself. I have anxiety, depression, and bipolar. And I spoke to one supervisor about an incident in one office, and this other supervisor gave me the option to resign or be fired. They didn't tell me what to do about it. So I resigned, like, I'm going through a big resentment now because uh, I give my peers my all. You know, I also work in the jail system and people with diagnosis and stuff like that. And I always share, I, I, to open them up, I open, I open up myself. I didn't know how many times I've been arrested or I suffer with. Because it opens them up, they start to feel a little comfortable. You know, and um, the biggest resentment is to work for an organization that's supposed to help people yeah, they were just so happy to get my resignation and stuff like that. So I'm struggling right now, you know, machine guns don't sound bad, you know, however, I'm not gonna go there because I got three cats at home that need me. Okay? And, um, I'm glad that Laura invited me to this, because I, otherwise I wouldn't have known because I didn't look at my computer, but I thank you ladies for coming and sharing this. And just in closing, I, go to, I used to go to this clinic called Rockland Psych Outpatient, and a friend of mine is Doblin. He suffers from hearing voices, and Doblin is a Beautiful young man. And every time I say, Dalvin, how you doing? And all he would say was, Pedro, his voices, man. Pedro, his voices. Even though I didn't hear him, when I heard voices, I could feel his pain in the sight. Wow. You know? Thank you all so much, okay? Yeah, thank you, Pedro. Thank you for being here. And, you know, I can definitely identify with the struggle working in a peer role. Um, you know, the first two, I've been fired from peer roles um, also. <laughs> um, it's a role that's not well understood. There's a lot of organizations that just get told, okay, now you're supposed to hire these things called peer roles, and a lot of them don't know what the role is. You know, I've been told that, you know, if you share that about your stuff, uh, share it openly, people are just going to manipulate you. Like, what are you doing here? Like, you know, being open about your experiences. And I, I honor, you know, that, that struggle um, because I think, yeah, there is so much power and potential in the peer role, um, but they need to be allowed to have their own unique values um, and be supported to be an alternative. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to cut this off here just because otherwise I think the principal's going to throw us out. Um, but I, I did want to, on behalf of the county executive and Commissioner Michael Orth, I wanted to thank both of you for putting on this presentation. I am in awe of the strength that you bring, both the message that you carry, but the personal strength of your willingness to share and how greatly you share, and it means an awful lot to us. So I want to, I personally want to thank you as well on behalf of the department because it, it's an amazing, amazing thing that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And before I let anybody know, I do really want to thank Adam Black and Annette Peters who have put this event together. It's a, it's all of our power from, from around the area of service providers to the, uh, to the community that joined us. This was an amazing event, and I really, really appreciate all of you joining us tonight. Thank you.